First Corinthians chapter three. I had the, uh, when I was studying yesterday, we had the possibility of different people showing up, and so I got a, I prepared a message about the gospel, and then when I didn't see anybody this morning, that's why I decided to go ahead and teach on the timeline, save it in case anybody showed up at 11, and now that they didn't, I'll teach what I was going to teach for Sunday school now, <laughs> right. We've been looking at Paul's epistles, and uh uh, we've been looking at the, the order and the purpose of the epistles, Romans through 2 Thessalonians. I don't think I need to draw all that up here again, but, but you have the book of Romans being the foundational epistle. Um, I'll just tell you right now, anybody not building upon the Pauline foundation is not building anything with God today. Paul said in 1 Corinthians that he, was, he said we are laborers together with God. And then he says according to the grace of God given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And he said another buildeth thereupon, but let every man te- take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Now I'll just be honest with you. Today, and what I mean by that there is if you're, not build, if you're not building upon the foundation that's been laid by the Apostle Paul according to the grace that God gave him as this wise master builder, you're not, you're not partaking with God in any labor that he's doing today. And that just tells me right off the bat that the majority, the, the, the vast majority of people out there or not all these people running around, oh, God told me, and God told me, and God's really moving in our church, is he? Or what, or what do you mean? You got a bunch of people coming that's excited about being there, joining a social club. Is God really doing anything? How can God be doing something you ain't even building upon the foundation that he gave Paul the grace and the, and the wisdom to lay? And so Romans is the foundation today, guys. And Paul told you at the end of Romans to mark them that's causing the division contrary to that stuff. You know what he says about those men? Men today, I want you to understand this, men today that are not established and preaching and teaching upon the foundation of the doctrine of Romans. You know what Paul says about those men, the men that's causing the division out there? By the law and baptisms and all that stuff. You know what Paul says about them? He said, those men do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. You can think about them. You can think about this thing the way you want to. Amen? Men causing divisions contrary to the doctrine of the book of Romans are a bunch of belly worshipers. A bunch of belly servers. Amen? Now, Now, so Romans was the foundation Everything from that point, 1 Corinthians all the way to 2 Thessalonians, we are building upon that foundation to take us from that carnal church that's divided with 10,000 instructors, 10,000 beliefs, and 10,000 opinions to that unified church of the Thessalonians that Paul said was an example to all that believe. That's our goal as a local church is to be a body of believers that come through this doctrine built upon the foundation that Paul laid in the book of Romans and building upon that foundation till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and we as a local church understanding the will of God become an example to all other believers of of godliness and faith and charity and patience of hope. That's, that's the goal of a local church. Now look here in 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Look at what Paul says here. You know what Paul's doing in this chapter? He's teaching you how to think about men. That Listen, man, that, that drives me more crazy in Christianity. Everybody always wants to rally around a man. Yeah. <laughs> right, don't they? Whether it was Shelton Smith or Dr. Ruckman or, or who, Lester Roloff, whoever it may, everybody wants to rally around a man. And you know what Paul, you know what Paul says? Think about Paul now. 
You know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 6? He says, these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Y'all ever read what's written about man? <laughs> Let God be true and every man a what? Liar. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men see if, to see if there was any that understood, to see if there was any that sought after God. And he said, they're all together unprofitable. Quit rallying around men. Paul even said it about himself. Look at what he says, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man. You know what, you know what Paul and Apollos was? You know who I am? Richard Jordan, you know, you know what we are? David Reed, David Osteen, Stephen Carter, all, all the men that I, I love and respect. You know what we are? We're ministers of God's word, nothing more. This is not, listen, man. I can get up and talk about this book the way I talk about it. Because for 20 years, I've been subject to this book. It's not my intellect. It's not my comprehension. It's not my own wisdom or understanding. I came to this book as a scared, stupid little boy. And that book has taught me a lot over the years. But guess what? That stuff was in writing before I got here. It's not my wisdom. It's not anybody's wisdom but God's. We are simply ministers of these things. Ministers by whom you believed. What is that? It's a minister of faith. Right? Through, through the ministration of God's word, you believe. How does faith come? By hearing. Hearing by what? So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes by hearing the word of God. And so we as ministers, all we can do, all I can do, is just, just speak out into the air. Once it leaves my mouth, it's done with me. And people look for every excuse in the world. People, people always want to blame me or other Christians as to why their Christian life ain't panning out the way it should. If your Christian life ain't panning out the way it should, there's something wrong with your faith. And there's something wrong with your relationship to the Word of God. Because the Word of God worketh effectually in them that believe it. So you're either not getting it, or you ain't believing it. But you can't point your finger around at everybody else and blame them. But here, here's what I want you to understand is that I'm nothing. Paul was nothing. Apollos is nothing. They're ministers of, of faith. And so you have, you have the minister here. Right? He speaks the word of God. Through hearing that word of God, the hearer either believes it or he don't, first off. But you see that ministration of God's word, it brings faith to the hearer. That hearing of faith. Now do you know what happens through God's word through faith? Anybody want to take a stab? For by grace, now the, pro the problem is, the problem is people quote that verse about the forgiveness of sins. Because they think that's all salvation is. Getting their sins forgiven. Did you read Ephesians 2 up to that point? That God took you, quickened you, raised you, seated you in the heavenly places for the ages to come. And then he says, for by grace are you saved. Through what? So how does grace operate? Through faith. How does faith come? Okay. Right? Guys, it's a waste of your time to ask for things God has already freely given you. Did y'all know that? He that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What, of all, what are all of God's promises in Christ? Yes or no? Or maybe? All of his promises in Christ are yea. 
It's a waste of your time to beg and snot around on an altar thinking that if you ask right, God's going to do something for you. God already freely gave you all things in Christ. The problem is, is God gives us these things through faith. Right? His grace operates through faith. Paul said it's not of works. Lest any man should boast. God's grace was not given to you on the, on the merits of your works. For we are His what? Workmanship. You know what grace is doing? The grace of God is making you. The workmanship of God. You are being created in Christ by the work of God's grace through faith. This is a work being done. When Paul said we are laborers together with God, this is what he's talking about. But my part in the work is simply to minister the word of God. If it's not believed by you, if it's not received, you may go home and say, oh, that's just preacher's opinion. Well, good luck with that. Well, that's just one way of seeing the world. If you don't receive what I'm saying today as it is in truth, the word of God, there's no point in even being here. This is a complete waste of your time if you're not going to receive what I'm saying as it is in truth, the word of God. Amen? Amen. Don't say that, preacher. They might not come back. It's a waste of time. Amen? Complete waste of time. We preach the Word of God. That Word through faith is ministering the grace of God to you. And that grace is performing a work. You see how me and God are now, I'm a co-laborer with God. I labor together with God in this work right here. But my job is here. Everything else, once the word of God leaves my mouth, everything else is God's work, but it can only become effectual through faith. The grace of God will only become operational and effectual in your life when his word is believed. God has already, did God give you righteousness? Did he give you wisdom? Did he give you redemption, sanctification, glory, life? Did he give you those things? He gave them to you freely by grace, but that grace only becomes operational through faith. Right? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to show you, that, you know, I, I just, I know, you know how I know Christians are crazy today? I mean it, man. They're just, Christians ain't got the discernment. What, what, is it, what is it Donnie Holt used to say? They couldn't rightly divide a Kit Kat, you know? <laughs> but Christians ain't got the discernment. A lost man had better discernment 100 years ago than Christians have today. If people really understood what was going on here this morning, you got somebody like Brother John, Brother Bill, would love to be here. And if people understood what was taking place in this church here this morning, man, you, you, if they really understood it, do you know what's being freely ministered out of this pulpit this morning? Now, my, I, all I am is a preacher, man. It's not me. But look, look, at, look at 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. What? Paul's a... What did, did y'all hear what he just said? You know what's being ministered from these epistles through faith? The Spirit of the living God. Wow. That's a gift. Isn't it? What about verse 6? Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth what? 
So not only are we ministering the spirit of the living God, we are ministering life through the hearing of faith. Look at verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of what? Righteousness. So what are you, what's being ministered to you? Righteousness. You know what that righteousness is? Look, look at 3.18 if you, want, if you want the gist of it. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to transform. This is the work right here. You know what God is doing through the ministration of his word? Through faith? By grace? You know what he's doing? He's transforming you into the image of his own beloved son. Amen? So we are ministering. Now think about this. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't trade this for all the money in this world. We are ministering the spirit of the living God, life, righteousness, and eternal glory in the image of Jesus Christ. That's the work, right? Look at 1 Thessalonians 2. We are God's workmanship. But guess what? I'm a laborer together with him. <laughs> Amen. And so are y'all. But there's steps you got to go into before you can enter. Remember Paul talked about the labor of love. Remember that? Remember he told the Corinthians over there, he tells them in 1 Corinthians, he says, we are laborers together with God. And then he writes 2 Corinthians to them and he says this, he says, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Paul's compelling the Corinthians to come in and partake in this ministry of the word of God that is creating this, this work of God. And it's going to be revealed one day. God is going to put, in the ages to come, he is going to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Amen? But we are laborers with him. Look, look at 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, there's the minister part. Ye received it not as the word of men. Let me ask you, man. <laughs> that's, that's a big problem in America. Big problem in America is people don't believe the book they have in their hand is God's word. Right? A, per, a, person, a person who corrects the King James Bible, does he think that's God's word or does he just think it's a reliable translation, a word of man. How are you receiving the book? I tell you what, man, if I, didn't, if I didn't have a book I could trust, I wouldn't sleep until I could find it. I wouldn't just take the next best thing, well, here's a reliable one, and this one's pretty good. This one's easier to understand. I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight if I didn't have an authority I could trust in. But how did the, listen, do you want to know the difference between the Thessalonians and the Corinthians? The Corinthians, the Corinthians were a carnal church, man. Let me, let me, let me remind you of this. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians six years after he wrote 1 Thessalonians. Paul spent 18 months. You know how long Paul was in Thess Thessalonia, Thessalonica? Wasn't long. He had to run for his life. Paul sent Timothy back there. He wrote epistles to him. Paul was in Corinth for 18 months teaching them the Bible. What's the excuse the Corinthians had to be the way they were? What's the major difference between the Corinthian and the Thessalonian? was how they received that word. Amen? They didn't receive it as, oh, that's just the way Paul 
believes. Or that's just Paul's theology. Or that's just Paul's doctrine. They received everything Paul said in the authority of the fact that it was God's word. Remember what Paul told the Corinthians? He said, if you think yourself to be spiritual or a prophet, then you better acknowledge what I speak unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Remember what he said in 1 Timothy? If any man, if any man consent not to, 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 to these words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. Right? And so how do you receive it? Well, you receive it as the word of God. And watch what it does. The word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So guess what that means? If you receive the word that's being ministered to you either by word or by epistle or by spirit. Right? If you receive this ministration of God's word through faith, guess what it's doing? It's doing an effectual work in you. It's having an effect. If that effectual work is not happening, then there's something getting messed up here. Either you're not getting it or you're not believing it when you get it. Maybe you're listening to somebody has got you messed up. Maybe your faith is overthrown. Maybe your faith is shipwrecked. By going home and instead of reading that book and proving all things by that book, you're watching every wind of doctrine on YouTube. And then men just take the 10,000 instructors in Christ had just taken that faith and absolutely destroyed it. And therefore the grace of God has no influence in your life because you ain't believing what he told you to believe. Amen. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 now. I have planted, verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered. God gave the increase, <laughs> right? So Paul's describing this ministry here, planting and watering. Because here's what the Corinthians did. Paul came there and taught them the elementary principles, Christ and him crucified. He determined not to know anything among them except Christ and him crucified. Apollos come in later. Apollos is teaching a little bit stronger doctrine, a little Deeper doctrine. You know what the Corinthians do? Oh, we like Apollos. <laughs> Paul said, I planted. Apollos came behind me and watered. It was God that gave the increase. Me and Apollos are in the same labor. We are the same. Me and Apollos are one. We're doing the same work. Right? Right? I fed you with milk, Paul said. But here's the thing. Paul and Apollos were both ministers of the word by which they believed, but it was God doing, giving the increase in here. But the point I want to make about this verse is this. What's the purpose of the ministry? What, to do good in the community? The purpose of the ministry is to increase, grow, and mature the believer through the Word of God. Now, when God's work is done, or when God does His work in, we, in us, what have we been created for? Good works. But you can't bypass God's work and just go out there and do what you think is good works. The purpose of this ministry of God's Word is for God to increase and mature us through His work in us to, to, to create us as that new creature that's been created under good works that God ordained before the world for us to walk in. I believe in doing good in the community, man. But I mean, do you have anything that you can give people other than $20? 
a hamburger, a hot dog. Because what good does any of that stuff do? What good does any of that stuff do if then people die and go to a devil's hell? Or what good does it do to set up a church with food pantries and, and, and clothes and all this stuff? Get people into our church, have knitting, women's groups, men's groups, breakfast and fellowships and Christmas parties and all that stuff. And then you take and present those people to Jesus Christ completely void of that work. You know why Christ gave himself for us? That he might sanctify and cleanse us by the washing of water. By the word. Why? That he might present us to himself. He's got a job to do. He is seated at the right hand of the Father to fulfill the purpose that his Father gave him. And you were given to him to participate in that purpose. And I want Christians all around this world to wake up and realize that this work, this ministry is important because we do everything in the world today except that. Where is Christ? I know He's seated at the right hand of God. You know why he went up there? He went up there to fill all things. How's that going in your life? How's it going in any of our lives? He's seated at God's right hand to fill all of creation. Amen. I didn't mean to even be mean this morning, guys. This was, this was supposed to be teaching. Look at verse 9. Guys, I struggle with this stuff too, man. I really do. We're in these old bodies of flesh, man. I battled since Wednesday night. I battled Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Get in the book. Get in the book. Hey, man, I guess it's going to be a war. We'll be fighting until the day we leave out of here. But there's nothing more important. There's no substitute for God's word in this work here. Churches are dying. Biblical illiteracy. Christ is, it's hard to find Christ in anybody anymore. What do we do? Let's build a basketball gym. Maybe they'll come then. Or let's, let's have a women's yoga class. And then you got these big churches. Let's plan a trip to the Philippines. They don't need you over there. They don't need you over there messing them up. I mean, you've done such a bang-up job in America. Why in the world would you ever think about going and sharing anything with another country? The marriage standards, everything in American Christianity is went to the dumps. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are laborers together with God. I'm a minister, you're a minister, it's God's word that does the work, that's the point. This is the work that we are laboring with God in. Now notice what Paul says here, I'm going to be sh trying to shut up here in a minute. We are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. That's the work of God. <laughs> That's what I'm helping God with. Now, why does Paul say husbandry and building? Well, the husbandry, ye are God's husbandry. You know what each and every one of you are? Each and every one of you are a plant of God. You've been planted and watered. The word of God went into your heart and it produced this faith. You know what the faith is? The faith is the root of your new life in Christ. A plant you, plant, you plant a plant in the ground. 
Every, the whole life of that plant is in its roots. Everything that plant needs to live, he gets, it, that plant gets through its roots. There's your root. Rooted in Christ. Everything you need is going to be supplied by God's grace through that root of faith. You cannot live and survive outside of that book. Right? But every one of you, so when Paul says ye are God's husbandry, he's talking about the perfecting of the individual saint. And I've, you know, I've talked about this before. I, I grew up in Baptist churches, you know. So and so got saved last night. Well, I heard him say a bad word today. He's probably not really saved. So that's how they are. They think they think they think something. They think I mean they, they think man gets saved. This work's done. Right? It's just over now. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made what? Perfect by the flesh. What I always say about the work of faith. When you plant a seed in the ground, how long does it take before you start seeing the evidence of that seed doing anything? You know, you, you know how much work of that husbandry, that, that plant that grows, whatever it may be, you know how much of that, of that happens at a level that you can't see? Do you know where the majority of this work of God is going to take place in the believer? It's going to take place in his inner man. You're not going to start seeing the fruits of that growth and maturity until the late stages of that believer's life. We plant, you know, I go, you go to a nursery and you buy, you buy a plant, and I say this all the time, you buy a tomato plant, it might say, or a pepper plant, it may say, 10 to 12 weeks maturity, right? But that plant, that increase, that growth, the point God, the, God wants every one of us to grow to the point of maturity in which we ourselves are bringing forth the fruits of righteousness, also known the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, meekness, goodness, these fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the praise and glory of God. So the husbandry is your individual perfection. Right? It's, it speaks of God's word perfecting the individual through faith. The building, when Paul says you're God's building, it speaks of these perfected individuals coming into unity as one corporate body. We cannot be... We cannot be in unity until each of us are, have this perfecting work done in us individually. Make sense? Why are the Corinthians divided? Right? That's how the church, they're carnal. They don't have this yet. Remember when Paul told them? He said that you be perfectly joined together. Right? All speaking the same thing, being of one mind and of one judgment. You see, and so as, as we take the word of God, we perfect the individual. Those perfected individuals are brought into a unity of one corporate body by the spirit of God's word. Ephesians chapter 4. You see where we're going with this now? I mean, we're, this is all leading to the example of the Thessalonians, isn't it? Look at Ephesians 4.11. There's the ministers. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of who? That's individually. Right? Perfecting of the saint... The perfecting of the saint perfects him for what? The work of the ministry. But here's, here, get this now. The first part is the perfecting of the saint. Look, look at Ephesians 
but speaking the truth and love may grow up into him in all things. That is every individual. Listen, man, I'm, <laughs> church is not a, an attendance thing, man. And I, I say this, I, listen, I, I want you to get this. So many people going to church, just going to church, going to church, and then whatever it may be outside of that, man, just living their lives. What, what a local church is supposed to be is, is a bunch of individuals that are speaking the truth in, in love and growing up into Christ in all things. As I grow up into Christ, you grow up into Christ, guess what happens? Every one of us are fitly joined together in the unity of the Spirit. Right? And so when people say, oh, it's okay that I stay a baby my whole life. No, it's not. You staying spiritually immature is detrimental to the unity of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. You, 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 you refusing to grow up into Christ yourself is tearing apart. Now, it ain't going to affect my individual perfecting in Christ. But there's not just the perfecting of the saints. He says, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of who? Of what? The body of Christ. Well, what is the body? It's not you. So your perfecting is playing a part in the edification of the body as a whole. Y'all getting it? Amen, preacher. Yeah, we got it. Right, so know this, that you staying a carnal babe like a Corinthian, you're not destroying the individual work of, of, of my perfecting through the Word of God, but there's a broader work of what God is doing through the individual perfecting of the saint. He's not, you're not just God's husbandry, you're God's building. And through, so through the individual perfecting of the saint, God is building a, a massive building consistent of all of us together in that unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. It's a big picture, man. So when he says there, he says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come. Look at what he says in verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of, what does he say? The faith or of faith? Unity of faith would be ecumenicalism. It's JWs and Mormons coming together and just agreeing to be uh, uh, ignorant the rest of their lives, right? What God wants us there's one faith, guys, ministered through the Word of God, and He wants us all to grow up into this perfecting till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. The perfect man is defined there as one who's brought into the faith and the knowledge of God's Son. Knowledge of the Son of God. Not just... now. Listen, people get mad at us because we talk about sonship edification. What did the verse just say there? Knowledge of who? The Son of God. How many sons of God are there? He's defined, isn't he? Whose mind does God want you to have? When you have the mind of Christ, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are what? The sons of God. That's sonship edification. God wants us all to come to the knowledge of the Son of God. All in that, when he says, be of one mind and avoid judgment, whose mind do you think that is? Whose judgment do you think it is? It's Christ in us. Amen? Uh, look at Ephesians 4.4. 4. I, I really am getting ready to shut up here. Look at Ephesians 4.4. 4. 
You, you understand now what Paul's epistles are doing, guys. We're, we still haven't really got into the layout of these things deeply yet. But do you understand that Paul's ministry has a purpose? And it's being ministered to you, Romans, through 2 Thessalonians, for a reason. Amen? Look at Ephesians 4.4. 4. There is one body and one what? Spirit. All right? Now, here's, here's the way I explain this. Is Christ divided? Right? Now, over here is the body, spirit. The unit, listen, guys, the fellowship of this body is determined by the unity of that spirit right there. There can be no body and fellowship in the body apart from this spirit here. If you do not have this spirit, teaching you and instructing you and bringing you into the mind of Christ, you are going to destroy the fellowship of that body. Does that make sense? So I always teach it like this. There's our communion. Did I spell that right? Communion. Yeah, I guess I did. But you see that? Communion. What is our communion? What was Israel's communion? They drank what? Spiritual drink, ate spiritual meat. What is, our, what is really our communion, guys? Is it, is it bread and wine? Is our communion chicken dinners and potlucks? What is the communion of, of the body of Christ? It's that spirit right there. We are brought into communion by one spirit. And that spirit that we commune in has been made to fellowship in one body. But this body will not function outside of that right there. You can't have a hundred spirits and a hundred opinions and a hundred beliefs and a hundred of ideas operating in one body. There's one faith and one knowledge that God wants us all to have to bring us into this one spirit so that we can fellowship in one body. Look at Ephesians. Now, I took the long road, but remember the building. Look at Ephesians 2.22. I'll show you what God is building. Remember God's building. Well, guess what? Acts 7.48 says the most high don't dwell in temples made with hands. Amen. So what is the building of God? Well, look at Ephesians 2.22. In whom ye also are builded what? Together. Remember when I talked about the individual perfecting for the purpose of bringing us into this corporate unity. Paul says, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the what? See what this body is? That body's being created to be the house of God's spirit. You getting it? These are the two great mysteries of Paul's epistles. Amen. For this call shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and who? The church. Then what's he say in 1 Timothy? He says, These things write unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry, that thou mightest know how, that, how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of of God, the house of God, which is, now he defines the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Well, what was the church in Ephesians? It was one body with Christ, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. This body, the church made one with Christ, is also the house of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness God manifest in the 
There it is. You see the two great mysteries now? The body of Christ and the house of the living God. You know what the body of Christ is? It's the house of God's spirit to manifest God in the flesh. So you know what our, you know what our job is as a church? To teach doctrine. That ministers godly edification through faith. Our job is to minister doctrine that teaches this body godliness and how to manifest godliness in the world. And hopefully we become a local church with this one spirit fellowship and in one body. Hopefully this local church will become a church that is an example to all that believe in Fairmont and Morgantown, just like the Thessalonians were. But there's, there's a ministry that goes along with this. I'm going to close. Last verse, 1 Corinthians 3.10. Put my notes up. 1 Corinthians 3.10. Now, guys, listen to me. I studied this. Okay? I studied this Friday. Studied this yesterday. I know how good it is. It's not my, it's not, I know how, I, I love being brought into this understanding. It's not, I'm not up here bragging about my preaching or my teaching. I'm beyond that stuff. I'm glorying in the Lord and what he's called me into and what he's called us all into. But you, you know beyond any shadow of a doubt, man, that hardly any preachers in America can get up and even talk to you about the ministry of God's word and what it's supposed to be doing today. Look at, look at 1, 1 Corinthians 3.10. Paul speaks of his labor with God and he says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Well, guess what? The foundation of the building's already been laid. And there can be no other foundation laid. You know the problem with people today is they'll let a church Christ preacher tell them how to be saved instead of going to Paul who laid the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't a preacher in Fairmont given the grace to lay this foundation. Yeah. You getting it? Yeah. You know who Paul is? Paul's a wise master builder in this building of God. He received grace to lay the foundation of this building. When he uses that word master builder, their wise master builder, it's more than just somebody. A ma the master builder speaks of him being the head builder or the, 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 the actual word architect. Arc means top or first, like an archangel. Right? When Paul says that he's the wise master builder, the actual Greek word that they translate master builder there is architect. An architect's not somebody that just goes out there and swings a hammer. An architect's not somebody that, stand, that they just say, hey, uh, stand this wall up and nail it down. An architect has the blueprints. He lays out the design of the building. Now, when you understand that Paul was a wise master builder of this building, and he says, I've laid the foundation, and now he talks about building upon that foundation. Do you understand Romans through 2 Thessalonians now? The foundation was laid in Romans, and 1 Corinthians through 2 Thessalonians is the blueprints of what we are to build upon that foundation. You have the blueprint, you have the design, you have the pattern. You have everything you need for what Paul calls godly edifying. Edifying means to build up. We have everything we need for our own perfection and for the perfection of this body, this edification of this body to house the Spirit of God. Amen. Doesn't that excite you? It excites me, man. It excites me. And uh, any questions on this? Next week, next week, man, well, I mean, I don't know. I keep saying next week we're going to do stuff and we don't do it because I start studying and go, 
just get all kinds of, hopefully eventually we can get into this, what Paul calls work of faith. That's what's being done here. As that work of faith, when you get into Ephesians, you're leaving the work of faith. And as you're brought into this unity of one body, you're beginning to enter what he calls the labor of love. And it's this body functioning in that one spirit, in the love of Christ, to make increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. We don't only labor in love and the edification of this body, but, but towards lost men as well. And then we, this, this hope of glory that we have, through the riches of the glory of this mystery, we, are, we have the patience of hope, which is what Paul deals with in Thessalonians. And so you're dealing with a work of faith in Romans going into part of Ephesians, the labor of love and ministering the riches of Christ and edifying that body, and then the patience of hope waiting for that <coughs> That, that hope that's going to come and reveal the glory that's in us through the grace of God. So we'll get into that stuff. The, the Romans, Ephesians, Thessalonians, the three main doctrinal epistles and what the other epistles, what purpose they serve. But any questions for our, for our close? All right, thank you guys for, for listening. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, for the faith, God, the, the faith of Christ and the wisdom of Christ and the righteousness of Christ and the, the redemption and sanctification of Christ. Lord, I just pray that you would, you would take every, you know my heart towards these people in this church. Lord, how much I love them, how much I think about them on a daily basis. And God, I don't always express it, but you know my heart. And Father, I just pray that each and every one of us would would grow up more and more into your son, that we would be, our hearts would be knit together and that our, our, our love toward each other would abound, our faith would grow and increase exceedingly. And we just pray, Father, that you would bring us into a perfect unity, understanding your mind, understanding your will, uh, that we would know as a, as a church how to fulfill the, the will and purpose that you've given us in Christ and how to walk worthy of it. God, I pray as I go to Stevens tonight that you would keep us safe on our way down and that you would uh, just, just be with us in our services down there tonight. Once again, we pray for Brother Bill, God, and we just pray that your grace would, 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 would supply what he needs and, and we trust that your grace is sufficient. We ask all these things in the holy and precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.